Hello everyone, and welcome back to Bend at Night, a brand new digital series where we dive into the minds of the developers here at Bend Studio to celebrate 30 years of making games. Tonight we're talking about design, game design. But we have two different roles here. We have design supervisor and technical designer. So Brianna, let's start with you. What is a technical designer? I basically am doing both programming and design work and bridging the gap. So if designers need any kind of like, I want something to fly, I as a technical designer would be like, okay, what do you really mean? Like you want someone to jump in the air and then stay there? Do you want someone to like start in the air and then like control how much they go? Do you want it to be an item they pick up? So like think about the technical aspects of what they're trying to design and then make it or at least attempt to. So just really bridging the gap and making sure designers and the engineers can like make their ideas come true and also within the bounds of what we can do in the game. So Jack of all trades is exactly Yay. perfectly summed up, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ram, so what are your responsibilities as a design supervisor? As a design supervisor, I am looking at all the content that's going in, um, be it from systems, from tech, from other designers. I'm just making sure that as a game, everything is cohesive. But at the same time, I'm providing some guidance, some mentorship. Based on my previous projects, I've worked on, on hire, some action. So I provide some guidance to the design team in regard to some techniques or methods to get the player to do something that they want them to do. I tend to be all over the place, and given the size of the team, I tend to also create some of the content. So I'm in there with the designers creating some of the content because that also helps me understand what I'm asking of them. If I make a request, I have a better idea of what's going to take to create that kind of content. I am in there in the pit with the designers, collaborating with all the different teams and trying to get the content in there as well. It's like the Ben Studio way, right? We're, yeah. we're scrappy. We're in everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What is your day-to-day -day when you come into Ben Studio on a Monday morning after a nice relaxing weekend? I ride my scooter into work. I get up to my desk. I have like a phase of like thought process, which is my slow weeks of just me sitting there forcing myself to think and being like, how am I supposed to make this work? Mm -hmm. It's like imagine like writing an outline for a paper you don't actually feel like writing yet. And so once you finish that outline, then I have my week of actually writing the paper. <laughs> and I'm like, fudge, fudge, <laughs> backspace, fudge. <laughs> and then the last week is usually submit the paper and then you're done for the week and then you can actually relax for the weekend. How about you, Rob? First thing I do is just go through emails, follow up with people I might have been talking to on Friday, usually starting with meetings in the morning with leads, and then follow up with all the designers, find out what they're doing, if they need help, need feedback. Occasionally I have one-on-ones um, to find out how they're doing, want to make sure they have the support they need. And then I'm in playing the game, providing some feedback. If there's anything that's not working, I reach out to either people who can fix it or find out who can fix it. Either talk to leads, find out if it's a major problem. So more like the high level stuff, but a lot more talking, which usually get, becomes mentally exhausting at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, I'm just relaxing. What's funny is I actually get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing people grow. I, I, the, the, the designers I mentor, seeing them grow every week. And that it's, um, Really, really makes me happy doing that, just seeing them grow because I'm just unloading. Every time I talk to them, the one-on-ones, feedback, whatever, I always just unload as much information as I have based on my previous experience because I just want to set them with a foundation. So in a large open world like Days Gone, where do you begin to design? As a designer, I'm looking for some narrative direction. I like receiving a document that has a, just a breakdown of where this mission level takes place where the character's at where, at, where the enemies are, what enemies are supposed to encounter the player. And I start creating experience based on that direction. The narrative direction that's given to me is sort of like a blank canvas, and I can start playing with the, I guess say, you could say the ingredients would be, or the, the, the colors would be the enemy types, the theme of the world, uh, what kind of mechanics do we want to show, and I start creating environment through there. So a lot of creative freedom yeah. with that. Yeah, creative, it's best for me, creative freedom without, within some boundaries that have been set by narrative. Right. How about you, Brianna? 
I, I tend to be a follower because I don't like to think too hard or have responsibilities <laughs> that require me to think. If someone has an idea, I am very much the, I'll just make it. I'll prototype it. I'll see if we can do it. But like <laughs> after that, it's like, yeah, we can have a waterfall. We can break pipes. We can make smoke appear out of a volcano that explodes every 15 minutes. So it's like me testing it out is usually the first phase I do when I'm making games. You could say we're problem solvers. We're given a challenge and we try and figure out how to make it work. We're given ideas, you know, create this kind of encounter uh, using this mechanic. And we try and figure out ways to make it as exciting as possible using that mechanic. The big question of the night is how do you make a game fun? How do you make it challenging but rewarding at the same time? What's your audience think is fun? But at the end of the day, when you're actually like testing it, it's really easy to be like, I played this game and I hated that part. And now I'm going to change it in our game because I hated that part. Putting yourself in like the audience hands is like a good way of doing it, but your own opinion is like as valid to like make those changes. I mean, we're developers and we're also gamers, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a really fine line between making something challenging and something frustrating. Because it's all about finding that that point where the, the player feels that their that the risk is worth the reward but it becomes too difficult, that's when they just start throwing the control and they don't want to play anymore. So it's always like trying to find that balance. And um, for me, it's kind of fun finding that balance because I've worked with, I remember <laughs> working on a, a waved combat scenario and the executive producer was playing with it and he kept on dying up to the point where he threw the controller down and he says, he told me, I like it, I like it. <laughs> so it's hard to send me a mixed message, but I see where it's coming from. Know? Because he only played that He's never played that scenario before, but from his mindset, someone who's played the game to that point, it was like an ending level. So he knew that a player at that point would be at a higher level, would know, would have mastered the controls. So I saw what he meant by that. But first, the first time I saw it, it threw me, threw me off. I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I used to be a controller thrower. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've learned. I've learned. Yeah. So how does design affect the overall gameplay loop? For my position as just a designer, sometimes there can be cases where I have to define the gameplay loop, but in other cases, the gameplay loop can be sort of requested from higher up, and I have to figure out how to make that gameplay loop exciting. Like, for example, um, going out to uh, the, the gameplay loop would be, you know, leave your camp, go and find uh, resources, and then come back. And that's the goal. And I need to f find out ways to make it exciting. What are the challenges the player's going to face? When they get these resources, who's going to be combating them? And so that would be my role as a designer. But um, it's very just, I'd be using the tech that Brianna creates to add those challenges and those mechanics and those systems. Thinking of all the scenarios you would use it, like, for example, if you, like, back to the waterfall. Let's say you want the waterfall to flow in a different direction. And it's like, design would wanted the waterfall for in terms of, like, we were making, like, a pipe like matching kind of game. And so we wanted the water to flow like in the direction of where you're pulling the pipe. And that was purely for like the game aspect. But in terms of like, we went to the programmer who's doing most of the gameplay like logic for it. And he was like, I mean, that doesn't that give away like what direction? Cause we didn't want to like force you to pick one side or the other to like flow the pipe. We wanted you to go like either direction. So then I had to change how the pipes flow to be like, I mean, it just doesn't now. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of back and forth between how you imagine the game should be versus how like you also allow the players to like facilitate what they want to do in the gameplay cuz even if you think of like a scenario of like yeah the players are going to come in through this way and then they're going to do this and then it, they're going to defeat these enemies and go that way and then the players like goes backwards walks backwards looks at a wall the whole time goes doesn't look at any of the things you made and it's like i mean Yes, <laughs> but no, that's not exactly what we wanted. And then like try to figure out how to facilitate both what you wanted the player to experience as well as like what the design saw the player experience to be in that area. That's where the fun comes to, where the player's trying things that we didn't expect them to, but they still have some opportunity to explore. And especially scenarios like that, where the player has an opportunity to sort of have that aha moment, let them tinker, play with this, this pipe. And then when you discover this, how it works, that's, that, that'll keep them coming back because they feel like they're, they're going to figure out new puzzles you know, on their own when realistically we set it up in a way <laughs> so it's the only option, but it seems like there's multiple options. How much does your work rely on other disciplines within the studio? 
my breakdown is, as, as I said, narrative would provide us some direction in terms of what's expected. And as I s start discovering what would be fun for a player to do, that's when I would reach out to other teams, uh, Brianna Animation, to figure out what, what do we have available to do. Like, like, I want to get the player up to this location, up to this ledge. What kind of options do we have? Jump, grapple, um, bow and arrow, whatever. And we start exploring, for example, using the bow and arrow, what can I do on the bow and arrow? Where, you know, do we have room to do some additional animations? Have NPCs do their own bow and arrow? And so I start relying on other, on the, on other teams to figure out what options I have. And I start developing the world around that. And as we get closer and closer to what the final state of this POI will be, that's where the other teams start refining those, um, whatever, whatever work they've done and start seeing how it plays out and just doing the, start iterating on all those mechanics. So like one POI could be what, five different disciplines within the oh, studio? Yeah, absolutely. In Days Gone, like our open world, you had animation, you had engineers, um, designers, all on deck on one POI. And they, they wouldn't be all hands-on at the same time, but there would be designers going in doing a first pass, artists doing, do their pass. Then we get NPCs walking around, engineers take a look at how the NPC is working. Uh, start, we start making adjustments to cover, then we get mechanics involved. So it's a lot of disciplines always coming in and off, coming, going in and out of a POI or area and just iterating on that. For me, it's bug fixes. Yeah. So you see a lot of people yeah. going in yes. and out, right? Yeah. As yeah. a technical designer, it becomes part of my job is to figure out if there's a problem, which of those people that came in and out is yeah. like the reason? Yeah. Because as a jack of all trades, I just have a general knowledge of it. So let's say you're going to a POI and then for some reason or another, like the sound in that is like a baby screaming. Then it's like, well, that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Um, sound, do you want to <laughs> you want to talk what just happened? Or maybe there's like all these cracks on the ground that's like, oh, snap, if the player steps on that, they're going to drop into an invisible hole. Level design, you want to talk about what just happened with the ground there? So if there's any bugs, it usually gets filtered out. If the producers or anyone who's like given the bugs, like don't know exactly where it is, it usually goes to tech design to be like, so can you guys just do a first pass? If I can fix it in the first pass, like, yeah, I know how to fix the ground. That's fine. I know how to remove the baby that's screaming in the background. But if I can't, then it's like, I know who to go to of like, you guys would probably know what's going on, right? And there can be some cases where you'll probably get bugs because designers are trying something that you never designed the tool for. Oh, because, yes. And it's because designers are trying to explore, what if we tried this? And that's, it's, it's we've, I've, I've, I've dealt with situations like that. <laughs> so yeah, it's just common for designers to try, some, try something that shouldn't be workable. Well, it's always fun when it happens, yeah, though, since it's, it's like, oh, snap, a new use case. Yeah. <laughs> I've never thought of that. Yes, yeah. of course it broke that way. But don't worry. I now have a very obvious place to test this out yeah. and I can like fix it up. Or just add a waterfall. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if a waterfall can work and no one goes behind it, then we're fine, right? Like, you know, just movie magic it out. It's like a green screen. Or something. As a designer, how do you direct a player through a mission? What are like your best practices that you lean on personally to kind of to kind of do that? Make the path of least resistance the most interesting. You have to make sure that where you're like leading them or the spaces you're leading them do have options for them to feel like they're exploring, but at the same time, make it pretty noticeable what the path they should take is, whether that is like adding a chest or whether that's adding an enemy or adding sound or adding like markers or anything, if you really need them to go through the pass. For example, there was a game I was making that we wanted to force the player to jump into the volcano. And they just, they, they didn't want to do it. But it's like, we like basically shut them into the walls and we locked the door behind them. And it's like, you're going to the volcano. <laughs> like you're not, you, there's no back. There's only forward. And jump into the volcano You have now. to jump in the volcano. And a lot of our players were like, I don't understand why you made us do that. We wanted them to jump in the volcano because there was like a different like mission we wanted them to finish. And it's like, that's like part of the narrative part. Adding to the experience of like, yes, this is meant to happen. And yes, you are trapped. But this was supposed to happen. And isn't it cool? We really locked you in a box. <laughs> the volcano escape room. The easiest one is the, is the enemy. The enemy's like the dangling carrot. Now, like at the end of a hallway or in a squeezeway, that'll get the player's attention. They'll go to where the NPC is. But if we don't have um, enemies to play with, 
just like Brianna said, just points of interest that are very interesting. Um, in other games that are like corridor or have doorways, I always like using the door as an opportunity because I know the player's looking at the door when they open it. Then when they open it, I frame the scenario so they see a point of interest framed in, on the camera. So that's a point of interest. So that will always be in the back of their head. But they can go on and explore, but they always remember that location. And they'll explore, find some enemies to fight on the way there. I always try and you find out ways to frame something for the player so they can see it without taking the camera, without taking camera control, like climbing up a ladder, opening a door, even just like games like Dead, like um, Elden Ring, just having those, those amazing structures in a the distance. They just become, they're immediately interesting to the player. So they want to go and um, travel to those locations. What would be your best advice for someone who's interested in design to get into the gaming industry? I work on multiple projects where as we're developing the game, coming up with a new mechanic, another studio comes up with another mechanic. And then we have to sort of advance. We have to iterate on ours to try and beat them. Not beat them, but at least stand out in the crowd. So I feel like being up to date with games out there in general, just being on the, at the same level with them. But I'd say in terms of just gaining some experience, just playing with the tools that are out there. Unreal, for example, is just... It's, I've seen so many products out there, just um, uh, trailers, uh, demos. So I feel like that's the e easiest step to jump onto that tool, get to know that tool. And depending on what role you want to play within design, you have an opportunity to, to really focus on that. While you're playing games, don't just play them and say they're fun. Start thinking about why they're fun. I feel like once I started thinking about the whys, it just became more interesting in how like games play. Like, yeah. for example, one of my favorite games is Fable. The reason I like Fable is because they're auto-aiming. And like I like their morality compass because it like it was very undefined. It just made you have horns or have an angel head if you were good or bad. And that was so like, like you could see it all and you don't even know if the NPCs see it. They just treat you like, I hate you because you're evil or I like you because you're like a nice person. But they didn't like comment on like, you have horns, you have an angel head, and of course you're good. So I like those like tiny aspects. And when I started looking into games in that lens of like, what part do I like? What is this? Then it became really easy to like start when I started making games. Like I want to add a morality system. I want to add like these things that like force the player in positions they don't want to be in. And so it made it easy for me to have these kind of guidelines to like figure out what I should be doing. And that also helped in like figuring out, yeah, I want to be a jack of all trades because it's like, I like so many aspects of games, it just became like, yeah, what if I want to do environment? What if I want to do sound, quest, level design, all of these things? I'm not good in any of them, so I'll just do all of them in a <laughs> mediocre way enough that I can get across anything I need to. <laughs> Thank you both for joining me tonight. It was a pleasure talking game design with you. And that wraps up our second episode of Bend at Night. Let us know what you think on social media by using hashtag Ben30. You can find us at Ben Studio on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. We hope to see you next time when we bring on two more developers, this time from Narrative. See you soon. Ben Studio out.